Let's open our Bibles to James, the second chapter. If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scriptures, that would be Old Testament scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, Leviticus 19, 18, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you're committing sin. You are convicted by the law as a transgressor. Pretty tough stuff, standard law, isn't it? And verse 10 says, if you, well, let me just read it. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has been he is guilty of all. Who would want to live under that system? <clears throat> well, anyhow, the Jews didn't have a choice with that. Uh, but uh, other than looking for the coming of the Messiah. Can you imagine they waited all those years, then hung on a cross, not realizing they were fulfilling? I mean, it, it wasn't a positive move. That's amazing to me. I mean, the Exodus was about 1440 B.C., so think about that. Then he comes out of the Exodus, goes into the Sinai, is given the law. And the whole law was given with anticipation and expectation of the coming of Christ, the eminence of the coming of Christ. I mean, in every, when you study the genealogy of Jesus Christ in every transfer of generational authority as a divine, as a divine agency, custodians of the word of God, and God raised up a prophetic voice of the coming of Christ. You know, guys like Noah, then later Jonah, all of those making references, Jeremiah. I mean, all along the path, you see this. He raises up a great prophetic voice that says the coming of Christ. And, and it was, and they all expected him to come. Just like we do in the second coming of Christ. Bo on both sides of this, there is great great. Um, uh, anticipation or at the eminence of the coming of Christ. We don't know when, but he's coming. That's for sure. And it's just kind of interesting when you look at the bigger picture from history. What a wonderful position we have. We're in the, we're in the, we're spectators in the bleachers of this whole thing based on the fact that we're a new covenant people and we get a picture. Listen, we see everything all the way back and we see everything forward. I mean, that's just pretty amazing. Well, let's have a word of prayer, and we'll get into finish our, our study from James 2, 8, 9 that we started Sunday. And I'll tell you why this is important. Look, look up here, Matt. Now, let me tell you why this is important. Because on Tuesday night, we've been studying the New Covenant and how, how superior the New Covenant is over the Covenant in every asset and every phase. And so what we've been trying to do as we got... I don't think we're halfway through the chapter 10, but is to show you the doctrines that we have under the new covenant. Whatever, whatever that was brought out of the old covenant has been just wretched up unbelievable as far as authority, power, awesomeness. We dealt with forgiveness last night. We're going to deal with love th today. Love. Whatever it was in the Old Testament, what love is to the new to the church age is lights out from what it was. Now, why that should excite you is because you live in that period of time. You, we live in this period of time. I mean, we have this whole thing. That's pretty exciting. At least it is to a guy like me. Well, let's have a word of prayer. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't apply it in carnality. You can't study it in carnality or apply it. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins. It could be sins of the tongue or overt sins. 
if you're convicted, awareness by your conscience or the ministry of the Holy Spirit of, of, a, of a sin of those categories or others, then your responsibility is confess them because you can't study it nor apply it in carnality. 1 John 1, 9 said, if you confess your sins as a believer, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. The work of Christ on the cross is extended to our life through the blood of Christ to deal with sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Christ brought the whole package into full. And so take that moment so the Holy Spirit can teach you great truths because confession puts you back into spirituality. Father, we're so thankful for what you've uh, brought to us in Jesus Christ and allowed us to live in probably one of the most exciting periods in the angelic conflict called the church age. We are so adequately equipped to be victorious every day, every moment, every day. It's unbelievable. However, the two power systems for the operation of this is walking by power of the spirit and not the flesh and walking by faith and not by sight. Encourage our hearts tonight, tonight, Father, when we look at the royal law of love and how it was placed into a superior position in the church age of the new covenant. So far superior is the love of God that we are able to embrace and exhibit that is unbelievable. Teach us that tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we looked at this text, went into the text, and we got through point two. We talked about, in point one, we talked about James' spiritual solution to the sin of partiality was the royal law of Leviticus 19.18. And uh, I tell you, we have something much better than that today. Uh, and so we discussed that under point two. We discussed that Paul gave the spiritual solution to the law of sin and death as a law of spirit of life. Uh, the law of the spirit of life in Romans, the eighth chapter. You know, Romans uh, six, seven and eight are just dynamite passages. And what he offered was a new. Listen to me. That's important in your life. He offered you a new covenant solution to an old covenant problem. <laughs> How about that? Well, tonight we're going to pick it up under point three, if you would, with me. We left off under point two talking about the prodigal son out of Luke 15. The prodigal son, most everybody's familiar with the prodigal son in Luke 15. It was a part of, it was a third part of a three-part parable. And it was about the joy of a sinner coming to repentance. The joy, the celebration, not just to the person who was lost and is now found, who was dead and now alive, but to those who understand that transitional period in that person's life, what a celebration that should be. Agreed? I mean, we saw that in the, the sheep, the coin, and the sons. Of course, I suppose most of us relate to the, the human part of this more than the than the coins or the sheep, but but the prodigal son, I was just recently reminded of this. I mentioned it maybe Sunday, I don't know. But I was just recently reminded of the, in dealing with a couple people this last couple weeks who had, had, had sold themselves into the slavery of the world. I mean, sold themselves. Now, they didn't intend to start out to do that. But 40 years later, when I'm dealing with them, they're a mess. And they all had, the, both of these people had the same, I said, well, how's it worked out for you? How's this thing worked out for you? Of course, you know, an addiction just destroys everything in its path, doesn't it? It's worse than a tornado. It destroys, the problem is it destroys every, I mean, at some point you can't get back to your, even your own parents who go like, I can't, I can't handle this anymore. All your siblings, I can't handle this anymore. 
And both of them made the same comment that I made here. And this is a great comment because there's, there's hope for you if you can get to this place. I am sick of being sick of the world. And they think their own only option now because they've gone through detox and rehab so many times. That don't work. <laughs> it does work if you want it to work. But it, it did work, and they went back, didn't they? But they'd gone through it so many times, that was a loser. Now, what do you think the devil's told them? Now that detox and rehab is no longer an option in their life of stability, are you with me now? Stay with me. I'm not t saying how you think. I'm telling you how they think. What do you think their last option is the devil's given them? Suicide. Suicide. I mean, I, I hear it a lot. You know, from this crowd, not not the crowd. I'm forget it. Uh, I mean, that's their only option. That's it. They they think that they, they, both these people thought that was their only option, and both of them said they didn't have the courage to do it. They thought about it, they tried it, and backed away from it. I ask them. So we talked a little bit. I asked him, okay, since that's not an option. I mean, it was given to you, and you said, I don't, I don't like that one. What is there? Are there any options left? And, and th there was none. Isn't that sad? I said, what about Jesus Christ? They said, well, we've been to church. Mm, I didn't say that. What about Jesus Christ? One says, well, once I went through a rehab situation, and... I got sober enough to get spiritual. I got saved and got spiritual. But I relapsed, and that was all out the window. Except now I was worse off, really, because I had so much guilt. I said, well, maybe it wasn't so much guilt. It was conviction. And he said, I, I felt like I was worse off. And that, that's a funny. I thought I was worse off after I got saved and went back than I was before. And I said, what do you think that was from? He said, I have no idea. I said, do you feel like a heavy hand was on you in your dealing? He said, yeah. I said, well, it's divine discipline. That's because God really loves you. God really loves you. That's why he disciplines you. And uh, so I read him the story of the prodigal son. Listen, I read him the story of the prodigal son. They both said, I've heard that story so much. Everybody preaches that sermon to us. <laughs> and I thought, well, yeah, it fits you. I said, well, let's look at it differently maybe this time than you've heard it before. Let's look at it differently. Because, listen, there's another option on the table. And I want to use the prodigal son to show you the other option that's on the table for you because you can still be rescued. And, and so I'm going, to, I'm going to give you the prodigal son again from a different approach. And I'm going to give you one Bible verse. I gave him Colossians 1.13. That tell you how it worked. And so. So that was heavy on my heart. And so it became point number three. Listen, do you know what both of them cried when I told them in the prodigal son? Do you know what the great option that's left on the table for you? Listen to me. And they wept like little children. The love of God. The love of God. I said, the one option that's on the table for you that the devil doesn't want you to consider and it's why he's drug you into me for this last journey. And, and, and guys, you telling me it's your last journey. I'm not telling you. You're telling me that the option's on the table. And when I told them the one option that was still left on the table was the love of God after I read the prodigal son was the love of God. They just broke down and wept like little kids. And uh, hopefully uh, went down to UAB and checked themselves in. That's what they said they were going to do and go through retox, the detox. But I don't know. But you know, that's an option. The love of God. The love of God. And uh, that's the reason I brought this into point three. The prodigal son had sold himself to the world. And the world took him in, 
and took them to rock bottom. You know rock bottom? You know, you hit rock bottom. And he took them, listen, the world, and listen, both these guys admitted the one, per, the one person, here's the church and here's the world, the one person, the church offered many opportunities, but wouldn't hang with them. The one person that hung with them, the reason they went back to was the world. Yeah, I said, but they sucked all the blood out of you. They stole your education. They stole your family. Yeah, look at the price you paid to go back to the world, but the world received them. I said, of course, the world loves their own. Don't you know that? In the same passage where you have this great passage on the love of God, John 3, 16, you have the passage the world loves their own. If you read down later, it tells you that. I said, but listen, what the world does, you guys both told me you're sick of the world because it sucks everything out of your life. Everything that is good by the time it gets through is gone. And, and it's gone because you've made bad choices. It's gone because a lot of things. And then you get into this funky place where you think mm, it could never get changed. This, my life can never change. Both of them have been in addictions for 40 years. That's a long time. That's a long time. I said, aren't you guys about ready to retire? Most people after 40 years on the job retire. Except guys like me and you, I suppose. The prodigal sold himself to the world. The world took him in, and when the world got through with him, he was on rock bottom. Rock bottom of the world is about the worst place you can be. Rock bottom on the, in the world where he remained until he became sick of the life of the world. Became so sick of it. It was then that he came to his senses. That's a really important word in it. These two guys, I told them I, that was the key word in your life is sin and the bottom line for you is the love of God. I mean, the only reason you're sitting here in front of me today, and they, they say that when they left, they said, tell you, I said, what, what brought you back to me sitting in Chick-fil-A in the back, back of the place? I mean, what brought you back here to me? We were going to hit you up? Right, really? Yeah. You, you look like a guy that, might be able to give us each five bucks. I said, boy, was that a long look? That was a wrong look. Uh, but, um, but they never did all the time they're with me because I hit them quick. Now, I could smell them coming down the, you know, I mean, they reek. But anyhow, and I talked Sunday about how God had to deal with my heart about that stuff. It was then that he came to his senses and when he came to his senses, I said he looked up to the, his heavenly father. I mean, who, who have you got left? I said to him, who, who have you got left in your life to look up to? <laughs> I mean, but he said, usually it was a drug dealer or somebody like that. You know? I said, when you was a little kid, who would you look up to? And they all had somebody. I said, you know, when you come to your senses, you, you want that back in your life. And you can get it. If you'll come to your senses and look up to your heavenly father, you can get it. I mean, he's always ready to take in. Is that not the story of the prodigal son? The father was ready to take him back, wasn't he? He's always ready to take you back. And, and listen, they were in the worst condition you could be in. Was the father still willing to take him in? Yeah, if you come to your senses and come back. Come to your senses. You know what coming to his senses? He was sick of the world. That was coming to his senses. I'm sick of the world. I need to go back to the father. Now, he had a lot of bad ideas about the father, but he knew he was better off with the father than he was with the world, and that's the secret. And so he came back to the father, confessed his sin. He said, I've sinned against heaven and you. He confessed his sin. He walked out of the world by the power of Jesus Christ. That's a pretty amazing walk, ain't it? There's your message, and it, that's the good news that we have. And you know what? There are a lot of people wanting to hear that message. Now, what they do with it is their business. Mm -hmm. It's their business. In John 13, 34, Jesus, had an, and as he opened up the Last Supper in the Upper Room Discourse, Jesus says something really important in chapter 33. 
uh, in cha chapter 13, verse 34. He said, I'm going to give you a new commandment. Ah, thank you. You wrote that down. Now, nobody picked up their ears on it. Yeah, he said, I'm going to give you 13. It's on your paper. 1334, John 1334. In fact, it ought to be in bold print. Is it bold print on your paper, William? No. Yeah. So I put that down there in bold print to see if it might be a gate question. He said, I'm going to give you a new commandment. What, we, what do you think that was? Love one another, even as I've loved you. Right? You also love one another. How many times did he say that? In that verse, how many times did he say that? I said twice, didn't he? He said, here's a new commandment. You love one another. Then he said, even as I've loved you, what's that? Unconditionally, in our worst shape. Listen, no matter, I told these guys, no matter how bad your behavior, nothing's worse than being dead in Adam. <laughs> Nothing's worse than being dead. Your, your behavior pales compared to being 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin upon your life. We've all been there. And God in his marvelous grace rescued us and transferred us from the domain of darkness into the, the light of the beloved son. So he said, I give you a new commandment. Love one another. And then he tells you how. Now, if you're a husband here, you ought to take this very serious because that new commandment has been passed on to you as a believing husband over a believing wife. Or even if you're a believing husband over an unbelieving wife. He said, you're to love your wife as what? Even as I loved the church. See, the... Loving your wife, your, your wife, husbands, is part of that new commandment. So he said the same thing. Love one another. And then he says, specifically, love your wife, even as I've loved you. That, that's part of that new commandment. Now, they missed it. I hope we don't. They absolutely missed it. It took them. It took them pretty, a pretty good distance into years of the Christian faith for these guys to get that. Now, you wouldn't think so. But it did. You know why? Old beliefs. Old beliefs. Oh, you'll see it in a minute. In John, the 12th chapter, verse 12, he's going to talk about it. In 1 John 3, 23, he's going to talk about it. In, in 1 John 4, 19, one of the great passages. There you go. Well, it's not the first verse, but it is one of the verses that my two-year-old granddaughter quoted today to, my, to her grandmother. Little kids love this idea. They learn John 3, 16 quicker than anything, and I think it's because it talks about the love of God. You put anything in the love of God, talk about it to a kid, that's feeding sugar to them. Notice that Paul, in Romans 8 chapter, gets into, gets into emphasizing the abiding power ministry of the Holy Spirit. I mean, you can't do this in the flesh. You can't love one another even as I loved you in the flesh. You, you can't apply this love of God, love your neighbor as yourself in the flesh. And that Leviticus nineteen eighteen kept everybody's kept everybody off their off their off their feet on it. You can't do it in the flesh. When you can't do it in the flesh, you go like, "What? Well, what's that?" We said it can only be fulfilled when Christ comes. It's a standard that you, you're unable to fulfill. That's the law. 
right? This is part of the law. It's found in Leviticus. <laughs> it's found in Leviticus. In fact, two of the great, the great things, the, two of the great teachings on the love of God in the Old Covenant came out of two books of the law, came out of Deuteronomy and came out of Leviticus. In Galatians, third chapter 24 says, the law was to point you to Christ because they show you can't keep the law. If you, even if you keep one and stumble on another, you've broke them all. Paul is talking in Romans 8. He said, I'm going to tell you what broke open my life was the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. Power over the flesh. To fulfill the will of God. When I began to do that, Paul says, I found that I had power to fulfill the law automatically without even thinking about it. How about that? I used to think all about the law and how I couldn't keep it. Now I walk in the spirit. I keep the law and don't even think about it. How about that? What an interesting concept. So Paul writes about this in Romans 8th chapter. He reminds us in the last supper in, the, in John 14, 16, and 17, when he's talking about the Holy Spirit, you know what he said? This amazing thing. I mean, you would have thought it would have rocked the world. In John 14, 16, 17, talking about when the Holy Spirit comes, he will take up residence in you and can never leave you will never leave you. You would have thought that would have rocked their world. They never heard that before. Not one time did the Old, Old Testament ever promise you that. Here it's introduced at the Last Supper and nobody even picks up on it. That's pretty amazing to me. In Acts 1.8, he's, he's going to ascend back to the Father in, in verse 11. In verse 8, on his preparation to leave the world, he gives you this great missionary verse. This is right up there with, with uh, Matthew 28, 19 and 20, or 18 through 20, go into the world mission work he does the same thing in acts 1 8 but he but he tells you how it's got to be done and a missionary that goes anywhere i don't care if it's across the street or into chick-fil-a and he brings them in and sets them down and lets you talk to them here's what he tells you you're to be my witnesses both in jerusalem judea samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth but you know you know what he told them Where, what's the power source? Uh, when you receive the power of the Holy Spirit, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria. Samaria? Samaria? We walked around Samaria. We didn't walk into it. We walked around it, uttermost parts of the earth. The only time we went there is by, is by chain, ball and chain, right? No, now you're going to go freely. You're going to go as a missionary. When you receive, when you receive, in, in a few days, you're going to receive power. And you're going to become missionaries with the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are going to receive power to be missionaries for Christ. And I'm going to take you under the banner of freedom into some most exciting missionary fields you could ever imagine. They could be just across the street. You know what I mean? How do I know that? Because you start in Jerusalem. We're going to do it. You don't, this not mean you start and go. It means we're going to do it in Jerusalem. We're going to do it. Listen.
when God put me in Jefferson County, because of Acts 1-8, I looked at every county that we bordered. That's Jerusalem, Judea. Looked at every one of them and looked to start a doctrinal ministry. If there wasn't already one there, we looked for it. Then we looked at major cities in the state. Huntsville, Montgomery, Mobile. That's the second thing we did. The third thing we did is we looked for bordering states. We looked at Florida. We looked at the panhandle really well. We looked further down. We looked over, and we looked to see if there was any doctrinal guys out there. We searched and found some. We looked at, at uh, every state that bordered the state of Alabama to set up doctrinal churches. And we did. We did it. One time in every major city in, the, in Mississippi, we had a doctrinal church up and running. Not one, not today. Not one. We had them across the state of Alabama. Today we had two. Well, we got more, but we don't have them in major places, but we got them. In Florida, in the Panhandle, we had two. It stretched all the way over to Tad Boyle, over in Tall Tallahassee. We, we, we were able to cover that area. In Georgia, we had four. In Georgia, never could get anything going in Tennessee. <clears throat> I don't know why, but we never could. But uh, and I'm going to tell you why we did that. It was it was based on Acts one eight. Then I met Doctor Bertel, and he says that's a pretty good picture. But what about the how about the ends of the earth? And I went, okay, what you doing? And so he was up in Arkansas doing the same thing, and. He was reaching over into different parts of the world with missionaries. And he was going on mission trips, and he was looking for hot, hot fields of positive volition. And he said, you need to, enter, you need to do that. And I, thought, I, I said to him, look, I'm really interested in reaching America. If we can reach America, I mean, let's just move. I mean, you go for the foreign part. Leave me, leave me alone. And... Uh, and just let me be happy in America. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a content guy. Let's just spread this thing that we're going. And uh, he said, uh, well, what led you to do this, Ron? I gave him Acts 1-8. And he said, well, that ain't interesting. That's the same verse that caused me to go to the uttermost parts of the earth. And I said, well, maybe I ought to have a larger vision then. And so we began to pray uh, towards uh, the uttermost parts of the earth. And Billy Morgan comes out of our church. Billy Morgan goes through the school and says, I think I might go on the mission field. Would you support that idea? And I went, why, of course. Where are you going to go? He said, well, I'm going to take my honey back to the Philippines. And you know, it's really interesting. That guy said that he learned their language in a flash. He said, I never could have believed I could have ever learned their language. I picked it up just like... Well, I said, you slept with it every night. <laughs> and he went, yeah, I know, but I thought, maybe if I'd have married one, I could have picked it up. What do I know? I know I picked up bad language when we had some Mexican working for us. They taught me all the bad words, and I didn't know it. <laughs> but anyhow, it's just the Acts 1-8 is a pretty powerful thing, and I tell you, you start doing that in your personal life, even in the life of the church, we're going to go through this whole system again. 
We're going to go through the whole system again. As soon as we get in a, a new territory, we're going to do the same thing again. Look at all the different counties around it. We're going to stretch ourselves out. And when we believe we need to fly the flag, we're going to fly it out of houses and on rooftops and wherever we can. You know, we don't have to have a big fancy building to do this stuff. You just got to have the word of God. When guys go overseas, they don't have nothing fancy, Rick. Where do you, where, I mean, fancy is maybe some place where you stay and you beat the rats off all night or something. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, so the power of the Holy Spirit working with the word of God, with the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, he said, when you receive power, you become missionaries. I'm not, ex I'm not you know, he would send them on a little stuff. He said, I'm going to leave. And they're going, like, well, there's our mission program, right? Because, it, you know, earlier he sends missionaries out, sends them out in twos and then 72s and, you know. And he, now he's leaving. They go, like, well, there's our mission program. No, it ain't. It, it's just starting. This was just prep. The Holy Spirit will come and you will receive power and you will become missionaries. Now, that kind of scares everybody, but how about witnesses then? He didn't scare them that bad. He just said, you'll be my witnesses. And uh, point number four. Now, we're, we get back to this word love. In, in, in the new covenant, love is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me show you the dynamics of this. Because I think we don't take that serious. So let me move you a little bit different direction about this fruit of the Holy Spirit. It is the first one mentioned. It doesn't surprise us that Paul would do that. He, he writes an item down there. You, you, can you imagine how many times he wrote these nine things down? God put, here are the nine things I think are really important about the ministry. Can you imagine how many times he wrote them down? And then God would go like, nah, let's change them around a little bit. Let's put some. I know he had to do it because he does it with me all the time. Now, I know I'm not as quick on the feet as Paul was, but he does this kind of stuff with you. And so I think personally, as a, as a student of the word of God, a teacher of it, I think Paul does like a lot of us. He writes things down and then tries to put them in some order, if for no other reason to remember them. <laughs> right? And so I always felt like the order of those things. I found it interesting, for example, that he put love on the first of it and he put self-control on the end of it. Isn't that interesting? Put love on the first and the ninth fruit is self-control. Well, which, which by the way, is a, is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. You don't. You know that, don't you, by now? If you've hit 40, you do. The Holy Spirit has control over it. Absolute 100% control over it. So you got you to you surrender that, don't you? That's volitional. So I find it interesting. So when I look at this, I think, I think kind of like a teacher, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Patient, kindness, goodness. I think he put him in systems of three. Faith, not faithfulness. It's actually the word faith. Gentleness and self-control. I think even the way they're listed is of great importance. And so here is the word love. Then here's what nobody can remember. They, everybody quotes this. They learn the nine fruit and, don't, and never, they, nobody knows the tagline. You could ask, well, give me the, I, you know the nine fruits, and they go, oh, yeah, kids, they learn these nine fruits. You know, you draw them, and they, they do all kinds of stuff with them. I know they do in our church. We teach this stuff. But you say, well, what's the bottom line of that? Okay. And they miss this. And, here, and so I put it down for you. Don't miss this. Against such, there is no law. See? I can't tell you. As much as all that's important, that tagline's really important. Against such, there is no law. Against such, 
Do you know that's as powerful as Romans 8 chapter down there about 35 to the end of the chapter? What can separate you from the love of God? Remember that? That whole list of things? This is as important here. Against such, the love under the ministry of the Holy Spirit, joy under the ministry of the Holy Spirit, peace under the joy of the ministry, and you go through the list, and against, against such, against such, there is no law. That's a pretty big deal, wouldn't you think? There is nothing out there that can prevent that. Nothing. They're against such. There is no law. That's pretty powerful. In Galatians 5.14, Paul said something interesting that must have been a breakthrough in his life under the new covenant. When Paul, old Saul of Tarsus, now Paul the apostle, when he wrote the whole law. Now, don't miss this because Jesus didn't say this. Paul said it. Paul said that the whole law is fulfilled in one word, and he gave a statement. Now, you're going to have to pick the one word in the statement. Would you agree? Now, come on. Help me a little bit here. All right? The whole law is fulfilled in one word, and then he makes a statement. He says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So what's the one the word? Mm-hmm. Right? Well, say it's an open book test. Right? One word. In the new covenant, God's love. Now watch this. This is dynamite. They, they all are, aren't they? <laughs> I know. I get so excited about all this stuff. Under the new covenant, God's love is imputed, imputed to every church age believer, imputed. That's given to you by grace uh, no strings attached, nothing. You're a baby, you're a baby born. Boom, there it is, imputed to every church age believer. At the moment of believing that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, the gospel, right? Listen, is imputed. Now listen to how Paul explains it. He says, he says this, and hope does not disappoint. He's just closed up Romans 5, 1 through 5. The context of this verse is Romans 5. Did I put that down? Okay. Romans, well, anyhow, Romans 5, 1 through 5. That's the context. And the context at the what he said in verse 1, 2, 3, and 4 has just now been concluded with, and hope does not, you, know, you remember, exalt in God, in tribulation, perseverance, proven character, and hope. You remember that series? Well, that's verses 1, 1 through 4. And that closes, and hope does not disappoint. Now listen to what he says. Now, but listen, remember that his tribulation, hope, I just picked this up now, I got to tell you, right? Yeah, open your Bibles. Oh, uh, let's go over to Romans 5 a moment. Let's just go to Romans 5. It, it's easier for you to put your eyes on it than me babble. The tower, you know, babble, the tower. Um, watch this. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace. Peace. We have peace with God. And now he's going to deal with love in a moment. Love, joy, peace. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, salvation, through whom also we have obtained an introduction by faith into the grace in which we stand. Christian way of life. And we exalt in hope. Now watch, he's going to open with it and close with it. It's like having a sandwich. You know, you got two pieces of bread, they're called hope. Then in between it is what, the, what you call it, right? I mean, even when we was little kids, we would put butter on it and sprinkle it with sugar. It was never called, it was, it was never called a piece of bread. It was called a sugar sandwich. Of course, you don't know anything about that. Oh. Well, we must come from the same family. We, we must. 
we might be kin other than Christ. Here we go. Through whom also we have attained. Now, a, a hope, uh, we have this hope. We stand uh, uh, and exult in the hope of the glory of God. And not only this, now pay attention to this, how he does this, but we also exult. That's a key word, isn't it? Because he's used it twice, exult. Exult in our tribulation, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. Boy, you should remember this. And perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. We started with it. We came back with it, right? This is the hope of the glory, exulting in the glory of God. Now he says, and hope does not disappoint. Now we're at my subject. <laughs> okay? We're at my subject. Because, now look, tribulation, nah, don't get me. What's it do? Well, it, I get into perseverance. Well, what does that do? It develops my character. What does that do? It, it, it re, de, re, re, redefines hope in the glory of God. It just, all of this stuff coming into my life is just building character in Christ and developing my hope in the glory of God. My confident expectation is the word hope. My confident expectation that nothing is too big that God can't handle. See, that's at Romans 8. Now, what, now and so he says, because. The be, word because is big here. Because tribulation can't do it, perseverance, uh, proven character, no, hope, 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 hope that exalts in the glory of God. Because the love of God over, overshadows all of that. Because the, because the love of God is the electric fence around your life. The love of God is the hedge around you. Because the love of God has been poured out Watch this now, within our hearts. What has been? The love of God has been poured out. That's a perfect tense. That's a perfect tense, a passive voice, and indicative. Tells you how that works. You. He pours the love of God into your heart for how long? Oh, probably until you sinned the first time. Yeah. Uh, oh, probably. Perfect tense is dynamite here. Because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts, perfect tense, through the Holy Spirit. How do you get that? Through the Holy Spirit, both of our gifts, both are gifts, through the Holy Spirit, who was given definite article with ditto my heiress passive participle the heiress is a point of salvation the passive is the voice of grace and the participle is the principle of doctrine under the new covenant that takes you to Galatians Catfish. this is a powerful verse now look the love of God was poured out into your heart in the perfect tense you got you got it all, the complete package deal. You know how I know it? Because it's in the perfect tense. Whatever I got was sufficient for time and eternity. It's a perfect tense. It's there. What's going to activate it? And how did it get there? The Holy Spirit, when he came, put it there. Who's going to activate that? How was that love of God does it work through the flesh now that I got it? Oh, no, 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 no. It does not. So how does the love of God work? How does it work as a fruit? The ministry of the Holy Spirit. Who activates that love of God in me and brings it up and magnifies it to the glory of God, both in me and out of me? Ministry of the Holy Spirit. Cha-ching. That's new covenant. Nobody had that in the old covenant. Nobody. 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 Okay? Nobody had it. Okay? So 
this one, this is a giant verse in verse 5. This Romans 5, 5 is a giant, giant verse. But listen, it's covered just in a good situation, Romans 5, 1 through 5. The dynamites of this verse, of that passage is just awesome. The love of God, therefore, the love of God is supernaturally produced in the church age believer by the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. Listen to me, perfect tense. Whether you're a baby believer, whether you're an immature believer or a mature believer, when you, when you allow the Holy Spirit to minister the love of God as the fruit of the Spirit, you get it in its perfect state whether you're a baby believer, an immature believer. You know why? Because it's not produced on you. Spiritual growth gives you the stability in life to produce it in a lot of different ways you could never in the flesh because the flesh would have interfered. Please tell me you know that much about your flesh. And, of course, that's the power of, of verses like Galatians 5, 16, 17. Walk in the Spirit. You will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. These are at war with one another. Now, point five. Hey, Rhonda, be sure I see you before you leave. Don't, don't get angry with me. Notice, hey, don't forget a God, uh, love feast. When's that? Bring friends. We'll have enough to feed them. Bring friends. We're, we're just, we're going to, we're going to sing and do a little sermon and just have fun and love on each other. That's what we're going to do. That's why it's going to be feast. We got to give a little bit of the word, but we're, and it's not going to be, not going to be heavy. Sam, have they recruited you to be part of that? Oh, I was looking forward to seeing you. Up there on stage. I know not, I know not <laughs> <laughs> Don't pull Shakespeare on me now. That sounds like Shakespeare to me. All right. Well, okay. I shouldn't have brought that up to start with. I'm sorry. That's not my business. Yeah, I guess it is part of my business. I'll make a phone. I'll make a phone call tonight. Notice that the last line. Once again, notice that the last line of 523, when we talk about the uh, the fruit of the Spirit, you know, like in Galatians 5, 22, 23, against such there is, against such. Which, when he says against such things, he's talking about the fruit of the Spirit, right? Because he, he listed them. There is no law. Now, here's what I want to show you. Here is a, here's a famous place with Jesus in Matthew 22, uh, verses 34 through 40. Uh, and Jesus explains ahead of time what is coming their way, the coming attractions when he dies on a cross and leaves this world, some wonderful things are going to occur because of the ministry of the Holy Spirit who is going to come. And so uh, uh, an, old, an old covenant legalist uh, comes to him and offers him a trap question something that they think they can get the goods on them with. I mean, sometimes the media just never changes, does it? Uh, anyhow, what is the greatest commandment in the law, he asked. You, you'll remember this. Jesus, Jesus answered, Deuteronomy 6, 5, love God with all of your life, really, right, all of your soul, all of your spirit, uh, mind, strength. And Leviticus 19.18, love your neighbor as yourself. And said, on these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. When he says that, he means the entire Old Testament scripture. It made up three parts. If you mention two parts, you got the third. Now, here's what's important. Now, listen to me. This is what's important. Both of them deal with love. Agreed? Because Paul said, they're all summed up. The law is summed up in one word, and he called it love. Remember that? Let's look at Deuteronomy, not, not literally, but let, let's think about Deuteronomy 6.5. Love directed towards where? To whom? God, right? 
Love God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your spirit, all of your strength. Your mind. Okay? Now, Leviticus 19.18 deals with love. But it deals with love your neighbor as yourself. Are you with me? Now, I'm going to show you something really interesting because Jesus is always teaching, always preparing the disciples for the new covenant, always preparing for the new covenant. The new covenant is coming. This covenant will be operated under the power of the Holy Spirit, right? And he's always pushing for that. Now, I want, I want you to go to John with me. I want to show you something interesting, John, that the Lord has opened my eyes to. Uh, in this, in the concept and the context of this idea of new covenant thinking about the whole loss fulfilled in one word, love. Okay, which the Old Testament people were familiar with. Now in John 21, he's in this conversation with Peter, this very famous one. And in verses 15 uh, through uh, 17. And so this is a very famous inner, inner, uh, inner dialogue. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, now this is, Jesus is in post-resurrection appearances about ready to leave. He says to Peter, Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And of course, he changed the word on him. Jesus used agape. He changed the word to philos. And he said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He used agape. He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Changed it. Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? Now, What do you think that Jesus is trying to get Peter to understand? There were two directions that lo the love could go, the, the spiritual love could go under the old covenant. It could go to whom? One, it could go to God, Deuteronomy, right? Or it could go to your neighbor, right? Because that's, how, that's the only two ways it could go. Paul learned that you could, sum them both up in love. The word love was the key, but it could go to the love of God or it could go to the love of the neighbor. Do you think that Jesus was talking about, about the love of a neighbor or the love of God? Eh, the love of God. Peter did not understand who Jesus Christ really was. E even though he was raised from the dead, Peter had seen other men raised from the dead. What Peter was missing was that Jesus was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit that in a couple days was going to indwell Peter and change his mortal concept of life. Peter thought that he was talking about love your neighbor. Jesus was talking about Love, love me as you love God. Because we're one and the same. And how do I know that? Because of what he told them to do. Was his answer wrong? He was failing the test. He failed the test twice. I don't know how many places you can get into the final stage of anything and fail the, the final test. I mean... I don't know how many times you can f fail as a doctor or lawyer, engine chief. I don't know. I don't want them guys. They keep failing. I don't want them to be my physician. Right? I'm just telling you what I think might be at stake here, understanding how you view these things. Now, you can do with it what you want, of course. Then, once again, an uh, old covenant legalist attempted to trap Jesus when he asked him in Luke 10. This is interesting. 
and I've got to quit here just in a moment. He asked, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus countered with two counter questions. What is written in the law? How, how, how does it read to you? The legal answered Deuteronomy 6, 5 and Leviticus 19, 18. There's a guy past, that guy was on it. I mean, you know how many times he had asked that and never got, got dumb answers? He actually got somebody that was smart. I, spiritually, I'm talking about spiritually. In, in Luke 27. The, le the legalist, not content to get an A in the class, wanted to become a teacher. Not content to be a student, trying to justify. Listen, he got an A. An A. What do you want? An A, 26? What are, you, what are you? Trying to justify himself, he said, well, who is my neighbor? He asked a question from his own answer. Look, what was his answer? Deuteronomy 6, 5, Leviticus 19, 18, right? Who's your neighbor? So not willing to take his A and graduate and be thankful that he had a good teacher, he tries to justify himself. He pulls out, who is my neighbor? Look, by now, debatable questions because every time he got them, Don't you know that everybody wanted him on his debate team? Huh? Everybody wanted that guy. Isn't that pushing numbers? The legal says, who's my neighbor? And so here's, listen to me. Listen to me. Here's what's missed. He, he, wants, he asks another question, right? Well, who's my neighbor? And, and his motive's wrong. Would you agree with that? He's got a terrible motive. I mean, it's all about me, about me and I think, while my professors don't think they can get you, I think I can because I think I'm that smart. There's a dumb student. But anyhow, I mean, he gets A's, but he's dumb. You know, you've met people like that. So he gives them the story of the Good Samaritan. He gives them the parable, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Here's what you miss in the parable. The man who got robbed and beaten nearly to death. Where was he going? Where was he from and where was he going? Do you remember? Hmm. He was going from Jerusalem to Jericho. That made him a Jew for most, most likely on a business trip. We've got a Samaritan coming from there, going to Jerusalem as a businessman. The Jew headed to Jericho on business, got robbed and beaten nearly to death. I don't know what half dead is, but that's how the Bible described him. I'd rather have somebody say, I was half alive. I like the cup half full, not empty. <laughs> but I'm just telling you the way the story goes. Half dead. Half dead. The first guy that comes by is a Jewish priest. Size up the situation, crosses over on the other side because he don't want to get defiled. Long comes a Levi, size up the situation, crosses over on the other side because he want, doesn't want to get defiled. He want to get his hands dirty. I got things to do and places to go. This would distract me. I understand that. Along comes the Samaritan from Jericho to Jerusalem, runs on, onto this guy, sees him, has compassion as a human being. W listen, there was no love lost between the Jews and the Samaritans. We know that from the woman at the well. We also know that in Acts 1.8, he put it in there, go to the Samaritans as well as everybody else, didn't he? 
which Jesus himself did. Samaritan comes along, sees, shows compassion for humanity. Gives him medical assistance. Takes him to an end. Be, is sure that he's now into recovery and not into dying. Goes, pays the innkeeper. Apparently, you know, if you're a traveling guy, there are places you just stay because you like the people. You know, if you have a, a special route, when I was with Graham, I did it. I, if I went to a certain place, I always stayed at a certain place because I knew the people and liked them. But anyhow, leaves them with him, gives them money, tells them to take care of them. I'm on my way back. We'll check. I'll clean up. I'll, I'll take care of any part of it. I want him to get well. Get him well. I think he's back into recovery. Get him well. <clears throat> then Jesus, and so he does. And so Jesus asks a question, right? What did he ask? Which of the three? Right? Who who proved? Who proved? To be the neighbor. Right? And and what and what did he say? It was what the person received from his compassion was mercy. He didn't get it from the other Jews, but he did get it from this. It wasn't, it wasn't it? You're absolutely right, Sam. You're absolutely right. And that was what he was after, isn't it? It's exactly what he was after. It's exactly what he was after. I think James might have might have added this to it. I'm just thinking. James might have added, which of the three in the parable of the Good Samaritan showed partiality? Two top men in the church, or two top men in the in the synagogue. And so there's a great lesson for you and I. I think James might have asked that, especially in the second chapter of James, about to ask it, huh? Who showed partiality? The two that knew it was a sin and it was a transgression of the law. Those are the two guys. Well, so it is. All right, let's close in a word of prayer and we can get out of here, people. Okay, settle down. We can, we, you know. Did you start the engines? What are you doing? I was with a guy the other day. And he's, he was on his way out and started his engine. I went, that's a way to get cars sold. I didn't know you could do that. Not mine. I ain't never have a new car if that's the way you can do it. Oh, I got my car running and I don't know. Uh, geez. Hey, he walks out the door and, went, and I went, and he said, yeah, I like to do that. As I drive my wife nuts with that thing, he says. I went, I guess so. <laughs> Father, we're so thankful tonight for your love and mercy and grace. Thank you, Father, for the study and the people you brought out by automobile and by Internet. I'm a face-to-face -face guy, Father. I know it would be so much convenient, so more convenient for people to stay home in the comfort of their house and study with me. I'm thankful for those who know how important it is to me to teach living people face to face, to see the Holy Spirit encounter and see people grasp. Just old school, Father, old school. Doesn't make me right, it just makes me different. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of this lesson, the royal law of love. Mm -hmm.